Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. You know, today's show is um, going to be very impactful and very interesting because we have a... We have a very creative and industrious guest. Lynette Eddy is the creator of the Open Heart Mindfulness Approach to Life. OHM, Open Heart Mindfulness, is a mind management practice that provides step to live a life well lived. She earned a master's degree in social work from the University of Nevada, Reno, and is founder of the Eddy House, which serves thousands of at-risk and homeless youth in northern Nevada. Lynette Eddy uh, serves homeless and risk and at-risk use with housing, food, the Eddy House does this, with housing, food, training skills. And in fact, this is very cool, Eddy House has been declared by HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, to be a national model for serving at-risk youth. Today, Lynette and I will focus on the teachings of her new book, The Fight Inside, Winning the Battle Between Your Ego and Your True Spirit. So with that, let's welcome author, entrepreneur, and humanitarian Lynette Eddy. Lynette, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'm happy to be here. I'm so glad. As usual, I had my pre-call, and I was so excited by the pre-call. You know what I'd like to do? I think, since we've talked about Open Heart Mindfulness, and which is OHM for short, can you give me a brief overview on what OHM is? Sure. It comes down to the concept of our thoughts, and how our thoughts determine our choices, our actions, and way the direction our life will take. And... And, you know, I mean, you think of it that way. Our thoughts are everything. There's a lot of depression, anxiety to, in today's society. And if we could better manage our mind, manage our thoughts, we'd be, we would save ourselves from a lot of psychological suffering. Really unnecessary. Yeah, especially, especially I, negative thoughts, right? And those self, self-flagellating self thoughts that we think of ourselves as less than, aren't those the ones that are really destructive? Right, and right. And so I did some research on this, and, you know, it, the average person spends or uh, has about 80, 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day, and 80% of those are negative. And a lot of these negative thoughts are worry thoughts, and say like 10% of the things we worry about actually happen. So think of all the necessary, you know, psychological suffering we put upon ourselves. So I did some investigating, and from personal experience, I lost my husband to suicide, and I watched how his thoughts became very self-destructive and when he was suffering, see, obviously. When he passed away, he left a note that said, I can't live with myself any longer. And not too long after, I happened to hear something that Eckhart Tolle had written and he was about to end his life and he said, I can't live with myself any longer. I said, whoa, that's the same thing that my husband said. Then he said, Eckhart said that he examined those that statement. He said to himself, and he said, well, I can't live with myself. There must be two of me. What is the I and what is myself? He came to a conclusion that he has a, the I is his true self and the myself is his false self. Mm, I love his that. Ego. Yeah, I love that concept. And, right. and we certainly want to get into true self and and false self. And you know, as we you know, the ego is a is a um, prime determinant in in how we think about the false self or the small self. And 
Tell me, you know, I think, you, you know, if you don't mind, I'd like to probe a little bit into your husband. And, and, and you noticed, and, and you, you, you made the observation you had been married 34 years, and you made the observation that your husband was in pursuit of more, you know, pursuit of wh- whatever more was, enough wasn't enough, and he was extremely successful in business, su- 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 extremely, extremely successful, successful in, in a number of areas of life, and yet he felt incomplete. He felt that he, that he couldn't live with the behaviors that led him to, to uh, pursue those, those goals. Can, can, you, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so, um, well, when I delve into what the ego is about, there are traps that identify in OHM, and one is never enough. And he ha- he definitely had that mentality towards the end. But, you know, when we were first married, he lived a simple life. He was um, compassionate. He loved nature. He meditated. And he was at peace with himself. And um, then he, he got into, um, you know, uh, finance, big finance. He started making a lot of money, and it was um, people he was you know, associated with, and it all became, you know, have to have more money and more possessions and status. And, and I kind of watched that happen, and he just wasn't the same person. He was anxious, um, just never at peace with himself. And then, um, you know, and then it led to a lot of destructive behavior, like gambling, and, you know, then I found out later he had girlfriends, and this was secret life, and I was just like, whoa, what happened? And at the time, I was um, uh, finishing my master's degree in social work, and I tried to diagnose him with the criteria from the DSM. It's a mm-hmm. kind of like a psychiatrist Bible to mm-hmm. diagnosing mm-hmm. clients. And I couldn't find anything. He didn't, you know, the definition of depression or bipolar or anything like that. I just knew he had just lost himself. And that's when I really explored what, how these negative self-destructive thoughts took him over and that's when i um you know it was not enough never enough comparing yourself with others uh he just um he lost that sense of himself which i call the spirit and you know that's really a hard concept to to define in our language it's, you know, it's been called, like, soul, higher self, consciousness. I just call it spirit. It's yeah. that thing in us. We all have it. Some people just get covered up by the ego. We lose touch with it. And to live authentically in this life, we you know, we have to stay in touch with our spirit. It's that one solid thing that keeps us from, it keeps us uh, out of going down that rabbit hole of self-destruction. Look, and, you know, and I see it in our society today. It's like uh, we live in an egoic society with all the consumerism and disconnection. And, uh, you know, it's we're starving for, for uh, the spirituality that... And he can't find. We're losing it because of the, the systems, institutions we live by. But um, in my book, I write how we better get it together and get our spirits because, you know, it depends on um, the future of the planet. I mean, oh, our ego-based, yeah, um, yeah we're, we're dominating Mother Nature and and um, using her, all the resources for greed and whatever, but You've got to put together and get more spiritually based and realize we're part of Mother Nature and we're all connected. 
what role, and I, I don't want to get too deeply into the psychology of it, but what role does our childhood play in this? It's a big piece, and that's, um, in the book I describe how you know, we have the traps of the ego, and I break them down so we can recognize them when they show up, you know, in ourselves. The other part of it is trauma and things that happened when we were conditioned birth and um that has a huge impact on our thoughts and trauma is the only way to get around it is through it you can't you have to i call it a wound you know these shadow shadow sides of ourselves wounds we have buried deep and you know we can recognize that something if something triggers us we're just like whoa where'd that come from need to just stop. You need to recognize the feeling. I call it, uh, it, I have an acronym called REAL. Yeah, and I want to get into that in a bit, so let's don't, uh, we're going to focus a lot of time on REAL. So, (laughs) so. uh, Trauma, yeah, trauma, that's a beast. Is it, is, is, is trauma related to shame? Do the two go hand in hand? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And shame is, um, it's, uh, the ego has a party on that one. It will, um, you know, just tell you you're worthless and how could you do, you know, it's, 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 um, definitely tied to shame. And at Eddie House, we have a, a lot of the kids, like majority of the kids have all been in the system or whatever, the foster system or whatever, but they've had trauma from um, early age. And um, what we work, we work with them on a trauma-informed care model. And that is, we really get down to the core of what happened. We say like, what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. We try to separate that and take the blame out, the shame out, you know. You know, I've had kids say, well, my did drugs more she wanted to do drugs it was more important than taking care of me and then that gets internalized and we try to unravel that and things like that we uh, all have it oh I mean, oh I'm are you kidding you're you're, you're preaching yeah. to you're preaching to the choir i you know <laughs> to the we to the have something downtrodden tide <laughs> and choir um I want to I want to briefly just kind of define for our listeners define the ego and the true spirit and you know I told you my definition you know my my I mean ego is much more it's very lab it's very elaborate and I have this little little my three P's I call it a vigo and I'm wondering what you think about it and and it comes from our neediness and it comes from our you know our negative self-talk and the criticisms and comparisons and evaluations and we end up with a need an egoic need of power prestige and possessions and we have the feeling that once we are in control and once we are accepted by some kind of group of people, or once we own things, I know you talk about cars, and, and once we own things, we're going to be okay. But those are, those are so superficial, and, and, they're, so, and they're so temporary that, that they, they really can't fill the need. So it is a, it is a, a, a never-ending regressive spiral in a hole. And I would like your thoughts on, on ego and, and why it is so... Why it is so damaging in the psyche of all Americans, but we're finding it as you, as you were talking about, we're finding it in youth as well. So could you tell me a bit about ego? Well, yeah, like when I first started researching this, you know, I went back to um, Freudian definition, but that's outdated. That was like mommy issues and this and that, but that's way outdated. And then... Um, Young came in with um, the shadow side, and then transpersonal psychology started um, 
focusing more on thoughts and mindfulness became main is becoming mainstream right now Mm -hmm, much more right so if we can understand our thoughts the egoic thoughts versus the thoughts that come from our true self our spirit so the ego egoic thoughts you say you just never have enough ego does not want you to feel peace so it will just try to disrupt Every situation in a net, you know, it'll just throw these um, self out into it, into whatever you're doing or insecurity or we all we all have these thoughts, you know, but um, never enough. That's an interesting one. You know, I tell the kids at the house that the richest man in the world or woman could be on a yacht and out in the ocean you would think would be so happy but it, they could be more miserable than someone that's in solitary in jail it's all about managing your thoughts and um you know i we even mentioned this together charlie we were talking about uh, victor frankel and man's search for meaning and he found joy and peace just looking out of a window in a um, concentration camp during the Holocaust, and you know, it's just finding that sense of self and looking at sunset or hearing music or meditating or being in nature. There's just you know, you can tap into it in certain ways, but the ego just jumps in there. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, and the ego. Like, you know, I, the, the yeah. ego is temporary fixes, you know, that they, they are, Absolutely. you know, they work, they work immediately, but then in the long, longer term, and, and it's even, in, really in the shorter term, not in the longer term. Right. They're and never the enough. They're thing never thing. enough that I need, as, as you talk about more, you know, there's a, a book that's, that's, that I'm really interested, I haven't read, it's called The Molecule of More, and it's about dopamine. And it's about how, you know, we will pursue dopamine rushes. And when we don't have a do- dopamine rush, it's sort of a, sort of a, a depression. And we, and we seek ways that we can get something new, something interesting, something, something who knows that gets us, that gets us rushed. And it's, it's, it's one of the, um, one of the prime, causes of addiction and and the ego is demanding these dopamine rushes let's look at the other side how do you define a true spirit because i love that idea i love the idea of that that we we move beyond we move outside of ourselves into sort of a sort of a cosmic perspective do we not yeah it's um you know i try to tell the kids, you know, try to define this concept, which is so hard. I tell them, you know, it's like telling telling someone what chocolate's like, but you don't know until you taste it. You know, it's really hard to define in um, language, but, you know, all the cells in our body, everything, when we're born, is changes out to when we're older, as we, you know, they, we... We are totally different physical beings, you know, when we're 60 than we were when we were five. Oh, but oh. The spirit stays there. That spirit is that solid thing that has you have your entire life. And it's that solid base. And, you know, intuition, that, that's a sign of spirit. You now, if you follow your intuition, the... If you don't, it's kind of like that's ego blocking it out. Oh, you know, um, I mean, I can get really into the cosmic connection when I think of harmony, nature, and mm-hmm. we're supposed to be at peace. And when we're in our true spirit, we do feel love, we feel peace, and that's I believe Mother Nature or the um, way it's supposed to be. We just, we have this 
egoic uh, little monster. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just won't oh. leave us alone. <laughs> but and, we have to learn to control it. You know, like, hey, I'm in charge, not you. You know, when we first um, talked, you you said that your approach. I, I don't. I, I don't know if I have this correct. That that your if it's your approach, but you talked about the um, integration of Eastern spirituality and Western psychology, and I think there is so much to that because in Eastern spirituality, and as is becoming more more common with Western spirituality, I mean with Western psychology, is the place of the ego. The ego is. The ego is starting to emerge. People are understanding the ego, although I think it's still a very small percentage of the population, but it is much more than it than it ever has been. And you, Lynette, you are, we have not even spoken of the entrepreneur and the creative side of you, that you have, you have created an amazing process, methodology, and physical, physical structure sort of piece, or sort of thing that's called Eddie House. I, and, and before we get into how you deal with the at-risk youth in Eddie House, I'd like you to tell me about tell me about Eddie House. Well, when after my husband passed, um, I really had to reinvent myself. And what year was I, that? I what year was that, Lynette? Uh, 2010. Okay. And I, I knew I had, I, you know, I was pretty much stripped down to the core of my being. And I had to rebuild. I didn't have to. I mean, there is a, there was a choice. And I'll tell you, it felt kind of enticing to just hang it up and just be like, I'm just done, you know, and go yeah. into the victim thing. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big one that ego does, too. <laughs> like, uh, in the victim seat. It's, <laughs> but um, I just I just pulled out my spirit, and, and I said, I'm going to do something really positive out of this. And I had the life, I had life insurance money, and I was that had my degree, and I said, okay, I use this money, I'm going to do make something happen. And I had done an internship working with the homeless, and I saw so many homeless youth on the streets in Reno, and I was pretty much shocked. There were no services for these kids. They were, you know, they were living basically in the shelters with the older homeless who were preying on them. So I um, then I slept out on the streets actually for a couple of nights um, with just my sleeping bag, ate in the soup kitchen, and um, really saw what go through and what they need. So I just pulled some friends together and my son, and we just figured it out. Like, how do you start a nonprofit? I mean, <laughs> we were Googling like, oh, we need a 501c3 or whatever. <laughs> yes, know, yeah. I, under- I understand. I've been a part yeah. of a startup nonprofit, so I understand what that's all about. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to it. <laughs> but we figured it, you know, just it just progressed, and then we opened a, um, started with a home for aged out foster boys. Aged out. Can that. you define what that means? Because our, our audience won't oh, know. It's when uh, they turn 18, they're emancipated from the system. Okay, so they can no longer so, be a foster but, child to be part of the system. They're just out there in the streets. Right. And, I mean, literally, a lot of times they're just with a trash bag of their clothes, that's their possessions, and, hey, have a nice life. It's just, like, heartbreaking, you know? And most of them end up homeless. And... Um, so then that progressed to a drop in center. Oh my God, like hundreds of homeless kids. And um, we would give, we had uh, food showers. Uh, we had all their basic needs that we could meet them at the drop in center. But we also started incorporating supportive services. We'd have a lot of counseling they desperately needed we had um, and we would work on getting their GEDs and then uh, 
you know, writing resumes and getting, you know, connecting them with job opportunities. That's amazing. And, um, That's amazing. Know, that just how to manage their money. Yeah. And 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 you know what, what I am what I'm surprised at. You started this in 2011, right? So we're really talking right. in a decade. You have built a house that I think you know. You said is 18,000 square feet, and you're serving you're serving thousands of youth. And HUD has has named you as a national model for what serving at risk youth would look like. That's Lynette, that is that is amazing. You know, I mean I can't you you are you are a woman that gets things done. If you can do this in a decade, that's uh that's a quite a, really a short period of time. Well, thank you, Charlie, but it wasn't just me, you know, I, we well, have of a course. staff, we have of a, right now we have an executive director who's amazing. Uh, the community community had to pull the, you know, community pulled together uh yeah and uh, we collect data data all the time so we know exactly you know what programs work which ones don't and um and we you know track success and you know hud was impressed by that but, and this is so important because this vulnerable age 18 to 24 that's the age group we work with and we you know research you know, studies have found that if you don't take intervene at that vulnerable age, most likely they'll be homeless for the rest of their life. And uh, social and economic costs of that are huge for every community. So, um, yeah, that's important. Yeah, you but, you um, gave me a statistic it. that that I I found. I'm looking in my notes. Now, and I'll just go from memory since I can't find it in my notes. But you said of the homeless population, the fastest growing people group of the homeless population in the United States are youth. Is it? Is that right? That is in Nevada. Oh, that's in Nevada. Okay. Not, right. They're starting to find now that um, seniors overall, it's becoming a... Um, you know, uh, they're they're becoming a major. Um, what is going on? Major part of homelessness. What, what is causing this? Well, you know, a lot of addiction, mental illness. Yes. And now with seniors, it's it's our egoic social systems. You know, we don't we don't take care of each other. And even even with you know the when I see I I've be, I've had many homeless friends that have gotten to know and they'll tell me people spit on them you know just come up to them and say get out of town you lazy whatever yeah, uh, it, yeah. it's heartbreaking and I go like even like last week I was out at the camp you know a lot of these people and that no one wants to be homeless there's that there is that small segment at they just um, pretty much choose it. But what happened to them to get them to that point? And, you know, though there is a segment that I'm, I'm not sure if you can help, but I hate to say that, but majority of these people, they desperately need, you know, uh, psychological um Interventions, a lot of serious mental illness, you know, schizophrenia, yeah, you know, serious bipolar. I mean, how are you going to progress in your life when you're, you know, to kind of survive? And it's that Maslow's law, you know, you have right. to have your basic needs met before you're going to, you know, move up and and uh, prove your life. And um, you know, that's why. We have uh, we have a housing first model at Eddie House, which is you know just get get under a roof, get in a safe place, and um, work on everything. But I you know I I'm hoping housing first model will you know become more mainstream around the country. Yeah, we have, we have those, one you know, in Orange County that we them. we financially support that we're really strong. You know, Lynette, you have now. 
is this you have a process that 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 may or may not impact severe psychological issues but you have a process that's practical that's that's a brilliant process that you call real r e a l and what i'd like to do is i'd like to spend the next half of our podcast talking about that and I'm going to take a quick break, and then we will come, and we will talk about real. Is that okay? Oh, great. Okay. Hi there. You're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I am with my very special guest, Lynette Eddy, who is... Um, focuses on winning the battle between the ego and the true spirit. And she focuses focuses this right now on at-risk and homeless youth. And she has a place called Eddie House that she not only provides shelter, food, and but she she provides training. And she has a training process that she uses the acronym Real, R-E-A-L. And I found this to be extremely helpful. So, uh, Lynette, I would like you to give us the breakdown on what real is all about. Sure, Charlie. Well, with the, you know, I, I use this on, uh, with the, on the kids at the Eddie House. And what I try to emphasize is how important it is to learn to manage their mind and you know that many of them have self-destructive thoughts and you know just their minds you know just out of control with you know telling them that they're worthless and this and that so we try to we try to get them to be the witness of those thoughts now that's a heavy concept but tell them don't just believe in all these thoughts that go through your mind like like clouds going through the sky, you know, and it just question them. When they come by, notice them, and then uh, tell them for where they're coming from. Are they coming from your ego or your true spirit? And if they're coming from your ego, you need to let them go. So I developed this um, acronym called REAL, and I tell the kids, like, okay, so you, you feel disturbance something's off you're just not just not feeling right something's off in your head you're feeling negative you're starting to judge or whatever you're just um off i say just recognize r recognize disturbance then e examine what's going on what go a trap is pulling you in and or is it a trigger from you're getting triggered from past trauma. Explore, you know, I tell them, just explore that. Where is that coming? Is it from you getting a sense of rejection from the past or, you know, whatever. And then acknowledge, a, acknowledge um, thoughts, a place of compassion. Like, don't be down on yourself or... No, I shouldn't be thinking this or whatever. Just acknowledge it. A place of compassion and understand what these thoughts are about. And then um, just let it go. Just let it go. And the kids, have, they practice this. I've heard stories, how it's worked for them in different situations. And um, it's, it's helped me quite a bit. I mean, you know, an example is if, uh, you know, someone looks at you funny or something or acts kind of like mad at you or whatever and you just assume some you know oh my god did i do or um Mm -hmm. you know it must be me they don't like me or you know Mm -hmm. and then you go down this rabbit hole and it ruins your whole day and it's just like really you find out later that you just had a fight with their partner or something you know that's just one small example but um you know like i said the the um, the most prominent traps are, you know, with the not enough. And just if you're in your true spirit, you will be like, okay, I am enough. I'm worthy. I don't need 
things to make me whole. I don't need drugs to make me whole. I am enough. And then, um, you know, stop comparing yourself. And with the young people, this is huge be- with social media. Oh, Always terrible. Always comparing themselves with others. Yeah. And uh, that's why you see the rise in depression and anxiety with the young kids. I mean, they're always like, well, look at all the posts. They're all happy and living the life. And what's wrong with me? It must be me. It must be me. And I'm like, hey, guys, no, no. Everyone, we all have our, um, you know, <laughs> we don't post when we're, you know, in our darkest times, you know. We, Unfortunately, yeah. and we're we, we to, should. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like we're all trying to have this image of this perfect life we have or whatever. And it's such BS. Excuse me. No, that's not a cuss. <laughs> but it's just it's just BS. And um, you know, if everyone were just more real with each other, I think we, would, we wouldn't feel so separate from each other. And... Um, Isolated, and that's huge in our society today. I mean, you see these shootings or everything. It's just like everyone's so isolated. We're not connected. Where sense of community is gone, and and that has to come back if we're going to survive as a species. Yeah, <laughs> All right, I, I'm sounding really doomsday, but I'm no, I'm you're pretty not. Um, convinced that's gonna that's what we that's where we're heading if we don't get back into our true spirit. And you know, then the collective spirit will um, take care of the planet. I think your process is, um, it, it resonates with Alcoholics Anonymous, that this is sort of the process of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think it's a process of a lot of therapy that we, you, you know, we need to call it as it is, examine it, ponder it, and once we do that, acknowledge yes I I am I have fallen prey to this, but this is not the truth. And if I hold on to this truth, it's going to be destructive for me. It's going to take me into places that I don't want to go. And that's why I think you suggest let it go and move on to something healthier. Uh, what is what would be the counter to real? Not just letting it go. What would my life look like if I am real? Well, you'd have more peace. And, you know, we were talking earlier about those quick fixes that we're all looking for, you know, the little sugar rush or whatever, to uh, make us feel happy. It's an artificial happiness. Um, if we're in the, if we can control these um, traps, then we can be have more equanimity we can be more at peace with ourselves and that's what we really want we don't want you know these highs of of uh, happiness i mean that's not that's pleasure it's not true joy true joy is peace mm, that's pleasure and joy that uh, you, you you make a distinction between the two of those right pleasure is just short short lasting, you know, buying new things or doing drugs or whatever. That's just short. But lasting joy, that's when you are at peace. Now you said that your students in Eddie House are very fond exercising your acronym real. What um is that is it so obviously this has resonated with this people group, that I need to think better, think differently, and and then allow my inner self to deal with it. Um, am I catching that right? Exactly. You know, they you can see a lot of improvement in their emotional regulation. And a lot of them come in there just like, you know, they get angry in two seconds out of control or whatever and you know when when they begin the process to really self-reflect and think about their thoughts and where they're coming from and understanding the mechanics of their mind a little better and you know it's hard they're at a young age i mean it's hard at any age but um 
once they get a handle on that, it's, they sit back. If they start feeling pissed off or whatever, take a moment. They step back, get in that witness seat, and they're like, okay, where is this coming from? And, um, you know, acknowledge it and and figure it out, and then and they let it go. I mean, if there's a reason for them to, you know, uh, be not happy about the situation or some someone did something to them, we'll deal with it in a much more, you know, appropriate way. <laughs> how long is but, your tra- um, how long you know, are your trainings the, on this? Is this is this you know a couple days, couple months? We have the drop in center, and and um, we get all the kids that just come off the streets. And then we have, um, we have, oh, maybe, I think it's 40 beds for uh, the kids that live there. We also have shelter beds. You know, we have kids that can come in and we have a a ton of cots and they can stay overnight. But if they want to go into our, um, call it the community living program, can stay in the, in, um, in our program. But no matter what, whoever is at Eddie House at any given time, I, we have uh, groups scheduled, and I do this group, this mindfulness group, and so with the um, open heart mindfulness. So, I, um, is that I, a large group? Is that a, is that a, a an intimate group? It's pretty large. It's you know depends on how many of the. Hopefully, we have youth you know that are out working in uh, school, but. You know, we have usually I'll have like I've had up to fifty kids and oh in my one, goodness, you know, and, seriously, yeah. And I'll tell you, this is a this is an intimidating crowd. You know, I mean, it's so funny though because I go, I walk in, and I start, and you know, I'm expecting they're going to have their phones in their face and you know, a lot of attitude and that. But I start, I just hit them right away, and they are just and they. They ask questions, and we openly talk about, you know, how how they're trying to get a grip on their their um, self destruction and so that, and um, it's really helped. You know, I yeah yeah, it's really helped. And at the end of the day, as as we're wrapping up our show here, at the end of the day, it all comes back to that battle between the ego and the true spirit, does it not? Is that is that not a sort Absolutely. of the core of the issues? Absolutely. I truly believe it. And I tell the kids that. I'm like, you know, because some young kids had asked me, I told, told the kids, I was, out, um, I was out at a park, and these young kids, you know, we were just talking, they're like, can you tell me what a good life is? Now, because I'm older, and it's like, you know, they were just like, what would you say how to live a good life? And I was like, Oh, do the right thing, get your degree, you know, blah, 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 all that stuff everyone tells you. And then I thought later, no, you should have told them, manage your thoughts, manage your mind. That's a, that is the key. I mean, that's everything. It's everything. We can't manage our thoughts. Yeah. It's thoughts, the comparative thoughts of negative self-image. And that those are, right. yeah. Those are those are those are not who you are. Those are markers of your brokenness that you have. You've lived under this broken model, and yet there is a way to, you know, an alternative to this broken model, which which is recognize, examine, acknowledge, and and let it go. I'm I'm a big fan of real. Um, and and so when they begin to control that, they begin to see, do they not that they have agency in their life, that they they have more I, control in their life than they think they do. Exactly, and that's huge. That's huge because we all have a choice. We don't we don't see it a lot of times, you know. Like that's why we have some. The depression rates are way up. Anxiety, suicide. Oh and, my goodness! Especially I'm these unhappy. days. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, if only 
did more self-reflection and got into our true spirit and just tapped into it to live each live a joyful life and collectively make positive changes in the world yeah you know as i'm as i'm thinking lynette (laughs) this is not limited to indigent youth and at risk and homeless this is a, an American problem. This is something, oh, as with your husband, it is it is something that that we as adults all face. And there are times when we think, "Do I matter? Am I good enough? What does the world think of me?" Because we are we are brought up in an age in in a spirit of of competitiveness and comparison, and then we live in this now, our our poor kids live in this social media world that is just a total fantasy world, and yet it's taken as reality. Um, I think you offer so much. You know, I I really would like to recommend your book to our listeners, uh, The Fight Inside, Winning the Battle Between Your Ego and Your True Spirit. I I think, you know, we have focused on children here, but this is for everybody, no matter... How old you are? I'm, I'm 73, and I'm still learning this stuff, and still, you know, working on if perfecting is the right word, but for, but perfecting my core inner self, and and you know, for those that are in the um, spiritual tradition, you know, in the, in you, you know, in my my spiritual tradition of the Christian mystics, you know, this is a this is a major message, and. And and as I was explaining to you, we are looking at love and kindness and acceptance, and we're looking for, as you would put it, we're looking for collaboration with the cosmos, collaboration with the way things are created. And in my paradigm, things are created by an ontology or agency of God, which is the spirit of love. And it is the spirit of, of you are accepted. You know, you talked about that it's important to be accepted and to be significant. Well, how much more significant you can you be than when you are at one with the divine, no matter how you define that divine, that you are at one with that and you have a source an internal source that you can rely on. Do you, how do you feel about that? Oh, well said, Charlie. That's yeah. That's, that's um. That hits it. Yeah. Well, Lynette, Eddie, thank you so much. You know, I um, I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put in my in my links. You know, we'll put the Eddie House and we'll put your book. And I'm going to put a donation thing that people can donate to the Eddie House because you're doing such profound work there and um i you know we want to support you any way we can um thank you thank you you, charlie well thank you for all you do so much yeah (laughs) you know i'm i'm amazed you you (laughs) you know i I, well yeah it it is what it is (laughs) um um i am just amazed at what you've done in a decade um you are you are with your team, I know you are such a humble woman, and you will give credit to your team and to all the people that have worked with you on this, but you have been the leader, and you are, in my mind, a godsend, and our world in the United States needs you and people like you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Charlie. All right, I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.